Is chaos engineering all about breaking things randomly or breaking things very carefully? Uh, does it have anything to do with you if you're running Kafka, particularly if you're running it in Confluent Cloud, which as we all know you should be? These are all fine questions. And the good news is Tammy Buto and Pat Brennan, both of Gremlin, a company that makes chaos engineering tools, are on the show today to answer them. It's all on this episode of Streaming Audio, a podcast about Kafka, Confluent, and the cloud. Hello and welcome to another episode of Streaming Audio. I'm joined in the virtual studio today by Tammy Buto and Pat Brennan. Tammy is a principal SRE at a company called Gremlin. Pat is a principal architect at that same company. Tammy and Pat, welcome to the show. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to ask you guys to introduce yourselves, certainly, and also to introduce Gremlin. So, uh, Tammy, tell us about uh, you and what a principal SRE does there at Gremlin and maybe a little bit about what Gremlin is. Sure thing. Yeah. So um, I'm a principal SRE here at Gremlin where I primarily work on chaos engineering, which to me is um, the facilitation of controlled experiments to identify systemic weaknesses. So really this idea of using the scientific theory to identify issues and then actually figure out how you can fix them. And Gremlin actually helps engineers do that because we've built a platform that allows you to inject failure and identify weaknesses and then prioritize what you're going to fix. And prior to working at Gremlin, I've been here for quite a while now, three and a half years. Um, before this, I was at Dropbox as a SRE manager, so site reliability engineering, and I was leading databases, block storage, um, and I was also an incident manager on call for all of Dropbox.com and the desktop client. Um, so that was a really good experience. And prior to that, I was at DigitalOcean as well, like which is big responsibility, looking after 14 data centers. Um, and then before that, the National Australia Bank, also doing a lot of chaos engineering in something that we would call more back then in those days, back in you know 2009, uh, disaster recovery testing. So if you think of chaos engineering, sometimes it helps folks to think about disaster recovery testing, business continuity um, planning, region failover. Those are the types of words that I like to, or terms I like to throw around to help people understand like what it is that we do. And yeah, that's just a little bit about me. Um, and a fun fact is I also, in my spare time, run um, uh, a movement, a global movement called Girl Geek Academy, where we're focused oh. on teaching 1 million women technical skills and girls too. We teach girls as young as like four years old. So it's really fun. <laughs> nice. Nice. I didn't know that. There will be a link in the show notes to that, a uh, link of your choosing. So please, uh, please set us up. Pat, tell us about you. Uh, so, yeah, I'm a principal architect here at uh, Gremlin. You know, I've worked in financial services for a number of years. I actually started out my career uh, in financial services, supporting uh, traders, asset management, corporate risk. Worked um, in the technology uh, industry for such companies as Sun Microsystems, EMC, Red Hat and kind of going and showing what uh, those technologies can do, how they can address particular business issues uh, that customers have. I've been with Gremlin for you know about a year and a half. Uh, you know, as Tammy said, it's really about finding weaknesses in the environment, going and realizing that not only these are the weak weaknesses, but how do you go and remediate those issues? And doing that you know, on a constant basis uh, because systems change, things evolve, cloud providers go and modify things. So you can get ahead to really go and avoid downtime, which, you know, can result in revenue loss, uh, can result in, you know, customers not being able to get the services, get the services that they, they need. So by going and remediating those issues, you know, we help customers accomplish better revenue, better customer satisfaction. Uh, you know, a fun-filled fact about me, um, you know, I actually like to work in my garden a lot during the summer. So ah. very, uh, very excited that uh, spring is here uh, and I can go and start uh, enjoying the fine weather, just, you know, kind of enjoying the peace and quiet of working in, in the yard. 
I'm uh, I'm also a gardener. I live in Denver. So if I were on oh. top of things, I would be getting leafy greens in and peas in like soon. I'm never on top of things. Yeah. Uh, you, you, early you May also, is just, yeah. as soon as Beautiful I go on city. that stuff. I used, to, I, I used to come to Denver all the time. I actually need to come back to Denver. Yeah, that's no, a great place. And for for uh, uh, freeze intolerant stuff like tomatoes and things like that, it's kind of third week of May. Uh, if you try to get ahead of it and go second week of May, you'll get that little snowstorm on the on the nineteenth. You know, just to teach you to obey the limits. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's how it is here. But um, anyway, gardening, good thing. I'm a I'm a fan. Um, I'll try I'll try to put a gardening link in the show notes. I feel like I should. I don't, I'm gonna, I'll yeah. come up with that later. That'll be up to me. Um, <laughs> anyway, back to chaos engineering. I I have. Um, I'll just, I'll just tell you kind of my personal history with the term. Maybe it was 10 years ago. It came on my radar as uh, a, a, some discipline that AWS had developed, where they had developed scripted ways of systematically breaking things. Um, well, scripted and systematic are redundant. you know. So there are programs, these agents that, that you get the idea of the cyberpunk thing of them autonomously traversing a network, whatever that, whatever that even means, um, and breaking things. And so um, sort of orthogonal to the work of the SREs, uh, by the way, Pat, the, you know, the impact of, of downtime is revenue loss, also lower life satisfaction for SREs. And so I think yes. with respect to our audience, this podcast, that's what we need to think about. That, that, yes. Nobody wants that, right? No, it's, it's, it's a burnout issue, right? And, yeah. it, and it's loss of, of institutional knowledge. That has a tremendous value. That's very unquantified. That's you know kind of hard to quantify. You know when you lose those talented people because totally, totally. And I you know I have a background as a developer and not as you know SRE is a new term, but not as an SRE or an ops person or an admin or whatever term over the course of my career we would have used. And I always sort of feel as a developer like SREs are like vaguely disappointed with me anyway because I probably broke something. You know. And that's a little bit of an old-fashioned way of thinking, but I, I just don't want them to be sad. I want to create an environment where they're as happy as possible. So, chaos engineering, as I look at it, is this, uh, you know, a, a a some programs, this service set of software that breaks things, and it breaks them in a way that's orthogonal to the work of the SREs. So, like you, you don't know. Uh, and check me on this. This is just kind of how I think about it. But again, as if this autonomous cyberpunky kind of thing. That's not how real life works, but um, uh, prowling around the network, seeking what services it may devour. Um, and then things break. And the trick is other systems and culture then has to adapt given that constant set of threat inputs such that downtime isn't, it doesn't happen when things break. Is that, uh, so, um, Tammy, you gave a, a very elegant account, a very elegant definition of uh, chaos engineering just a minute ago. And everybody, you should rewind and listen to that again. Does my definition work? Yeah. That's, so that's what I think of. Yeah, it's interesting. So um, I'd say like different people do different types of chaos engineering. And the type that you're explaining is more what I see folks do when they're more advanced. Okay. So like it's usually best, I say, you know, we say at Gremlin to start with a small blast radius, like super controlled experiments, make sure that you over communicate. This is my plan. This is the type of failure I'm going to inject. This is how I'm going to inject it. This is when I'm going to inject it. And then do something what we call a game day, which also comes from Amazon. And, and both of our founders at Gremlin are from Amazon. So they work there as engineers and um, yeah, Colton and Forney. And they built like the chaos engineering platforms at Amazon. And um, then they decided to go out and create Gremlin as a company. They also worked at Netflix and a few other companies. Um, and so I like this idea though of like, initially when you start doing a game day is really good. And it, it's that thing of, you know, the value of bringing people together. So say, you know, five to 10 people in a room. I've seen massive game days with, you know, 70 to 80 engineers in a room. You whiteboard out, what it is that you're going to actually be focused on. So the piece of your system, your architecture diagram, and then you pick like, okay, we're going to inject latency from here to here, or we're going to do, you know, something quite small. Like we're going to take down this one service and see what happens to its dependencies. 
um, or maybe inject packet loss, something like that. And that's a better way to usually start. Then what we see folks do is they move to automation, which is really cool, right? Because then instead of it happening randomly at some point in time, it's just happening every day, which is so cool that you're like injecting failure every day so you don't drift into failure. Um, and it enables you to do a lot of important things like validate that your monitoring and alerting always works if something does break, you know? So yeah, that's something that Pat and I think about a lot in terms of the different types of use cases of chaos engineering. And we get to work with a lot of different customers, a lot of companies all over the world, like a lot of huge banks and um, finance companies, as well as e-commerce. And that's like the types of things that they really care about is start small, but then scale out your practice because you want it to work really well for your entire organization. And if you've got, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of machines that you're responsible for, but a pretty small team, that's like a lot of responsibility in terms of reliability and maybe downtime costs hundreds of thousands of dollars for five minutes, you know, so that's what you're trying to stop. So it is more frequent failure injection, I think. But yeah, Pat, like, what would you say there? Like, you've seen lots of different approaches as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, to that point, Tim, about starting with that small blast radius and progressively increasing it, mm -hmm. um, you know, defining that hypothesis, learning from it. And one of the other things that we see is that people learn about dependencies that they don't know they have. Yes. And when we look at that, that has a that is you know key to understanding what the dependencies are when we get into DR. So whether you're on prem or you're dealing with you know region you know region outages and saying I want to be able to fail over to a different region in the cloud, I need to understand what my dependencies are to help go and I identify that. And to you know Tammy's points about you know game day, it not only is it a way to get people you know. Um, on the same page, but they bring different levels of expertise around an application, around operational issues, around development issues, and you're bringing them together and it forms collaboration. So now people are collaborating, they're working on a single goal of making the environment more resilient, but they are also learning from one another. So that's to kind of Tammy's point about over communicating. And that's really, really valuable and something that we at really advocate for, which is bringing people together so not only can they bring their expertise, but they can learn from one another. So a couple of, a couple of things. Number one, apparently uh, introducing chaos engineering to an organization by writing a script that randomly instigates like a cross-region failover or something like that. You're saying, without telling anybody, bad way to do it. Yeah, I, will, I, that, I always that. say that every time I give a talk, I'm like, please don't go into work tomorrow and like take down a whole region just randomly. That's like- <laughs> They said it would make it anti-fragile. I thought, I thought that's how it worked. Right? <laughs> baby steps. Baby steps. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, like stressing bones makes them stronger too, but you don't just like crunch them all, exactly. all at once. Yeah. 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 You gotta, it's then, like weightlifting, right? Like you don't want to just like lift like the hugest weight. You got to work your way up to it. Yeah. Well, number one, you won't be able to. Number two, there's wow. an in-between stage there where you will, but you'll get injured. But yes, I'm thinking as you guys are talking that of the, I'm sure you go through this all the time, but the, the obvious biological metaphors of like exercising a muscle damages yeah. the muscle tissue. Yeah. And when exactly. it heals, it heals stronger. And, you know, bones, little bits of stress on bones that created by walking around makes the bones stronger. And, you know, we have a problem with long-term space flight and, and bone density where, where you're not, you know, the, the uh, gremlin isn't running anymore. Basically, you know, you, mm -hmm. you don't have the, the chaos inputs and the system gets weaker. So you're trying to, you're trying to uh, create an environment where people are building systems that respond to small insults by getting stronger. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it seems like there's two, you know, you, you really talked about two systems, you guys just then, where there's, we'll just call it the network, you know, whatever the computers are and however they're connected and whatever those services are doing and interacting with the outside world. But then there's the people and getting the people in the room to work on small broken things uh, changes the organization. So, Reflect on that for a minute. Whoever, either, either jump ball. What, uh, what do you think? Yeah, of uh, yeah. yeah. So it's a really interesting thing because part of it is cultural, right? So, you know, 
people can you know go and work on this or then go work on this or work on this and there's you know a little bit of that kind of silo effect right but what we're really doing is you know your the, the biggest success the best success is kind of involves kind of a cultural change right is getting people to work together to collaborate on things um that's that's a huge that's a huge part of it and we've been seeing that for a while now right or how do we work together how do we go and collaborate because you know it's it's, it's been interesting that you know um COVID has changed a lot of how we work we work at home we rely more on the network our business models have had to adjust and change right mm -hmm. um companies have had to say okay i need to focus more online right i need to make sure that my systems are more reliable right so i need to understand i need to understand things that requires breaking those silos down and you know getting people working together so that i have that when i have outages you know again you know that the aws outage last year the region outage mm -hmm. how do i need to make sure that you know i can recover i can recover from that so a lot of external events have caused people to think about have to think about how do i accomplish this and analyze that yeah, yeah it's super important it's interesting too like i love the idea of using game days as a way to share knowledge across an organization and also between different levels so say if you have folks who are you know they've just graduated from college or they're an intern maybe they've come through a boot camp and they want to gain knowledge that's like such a good way to understand how things work and also to see more senior engineers role model good behaviors of like I know that this section of the system works in this way, but I'm not sure about that section. Maybe we need to read the code or maybe we t need to like dive into that a bit more. Does anyone in the room know? Like just to be able to openly explain, like I don't know everything, like we're here to figure this out together. That's like really empowering for junior engineers when they join. Yeah. And another yeah. thing, yeah, I love that so much. Like it's similar to if you have a post-mortem, so like a blameless post-mortem and you invite in engineers of different levels and they see that it's just a learning experience, like that's what it's about and you're just trying to make things better for people and for the systems, yeah. Yeah, yeah, B blame of course impairs, well, individual and organizational learning, but uh, super great point about the more senior, respected, yeah. even informal leaders in the engineering organizations when they're, uh, you know, when they're openly being ignorant, yeah, sort of shamelessly being ignorant. Well, I don't yeah. know what that code does. Let's look at that. Yeah, because a junior engineer looks at a senior engineer and thinks, well, well, they, they know every, and you know, yeah, it's crazy even for adults still to think this way. <laughs> but you do it. You know, yeah. they know everything. They know all the code. They always have the answers. But modeling ignorance in that kind of collaborative problem solving setting, boy, what a great outcome of starting out by saying we're going to break things. Yeah, it's really cool. And it like shows you how folks learn something really fast. Um, like there's a book that I love called Make It Stick, which is all about how to learn and remember what you learned. Like there's, a, there's a blurry that. copy of that. Oh, you've got that. That's awesome. The back there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you can't see I it. Love it's that book. And it's just like, you know, giving folks a chance. When you're in a game day with 15 people, you see how 15 different people learn. And like, you know, some people want to get up and draw if it's in a room or they want to do it, um, you know, on say Miro if it's like an online whiteboard. Some folks want to debate, you know, they kind of want to spar a little bit about things and that's fine too. And just like, it's good to see those different styles or maybe they'll be like, oh, let me just pull up that, the code there. Look, let me look at the commit history and understand why we change this, when we change this. Or let me run some commands to look at the system to understand the observability that we have in place. Yeah. That's really interesting. How much time do you folks spend when, I mean, Gremlin's a, it's a, it's a product. It's a, it's a thing that you could buy. And I want to talk about the, you know, how does this become productized in a minute? Um, the, the streaming audio is never about commercials, but we talk about things that you can buy and it's okay. Cause like we buy things and that's good. But how much of your time do you spend on the organizational stuff? Cause it, it sounds like, okay, we need some software to break things. And now we need to teach people how to learn together when things are broken. Yeah. Is that a lot of it for you? A, lo a lot of what I do is probably watching folks do that. Like I enjoy if, so for me, it's really cool. I, I like the idea of working at Gremlin because, you know, I've always done SRE work, but it was like, I was doing the same work over and over whenever I worked at a company, you know, looking after a new team, do the exact same thing to improve the reliability and I was able to get like a 10x reduction in incidents using my like framework of how to improve it reliability, you know, and I can do it in like three months. Okay, roll that out over and over. But 
being able to actually shadow folks and see the differences in different industries, like reliability does change, like how you can improve reliability changes per industry, um, changes like depending on the mixture of like senior to junior engineers, how empowered the team is, like how much their leadership believes in them and gives them the ability to actually fix that. So a lot of what I do is just getting to like, I, I love celebrating people's wins and being there alongside them to like see them achieve what they set out to achieve like just today, HEB, um, they're a customer of ours and they were saying they just finished rolling out curbside pickup and they use Gremlin to make sure it was reliable and it's like been a huge success. And that's like really cool, you know, to help people get their groceries during this time, the pandemic, where things are hard. But I, I think for me that like that's like why what we do is important for reliability, always relating it back to real people out in the world that need us to do what we do every day. Um, so I think it's probably for Pat and I like a motivational thing and Gremlin, the platform. Yeah. Like, you know, you can log in, like there's a free version as well. So you don't have to pay to get started. Um, if you go to gremlin.com slash free, but there's 12 attacks that come built in. It's very easy to get started and just try it out to learn about failure. But probably one of the things that we want to help people understand is you need to do it in a meaningful way. Think about how you're going to measure success. Think about what the ROI is. Um, like I, I mean, I come from a punk background. Like I love punk rock and uh, No Effects, one of my favorite bands. But you know, you can't be too punk when you're doing it. Like it's good because you are injecting failure and you're identifying weaknesses and you're doing something that is different from what you would usually do in your career, which makes it really cool and really interesting. Um, but you have to bring people on the journey with you. You don't want to. You don't want to be like playing a punk show and have no one there. You know what I mean? It's like not as right. fun. <laughs> it's, it's not a good look. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it's also, you know, it's um, it's kind of connecting that from a business perspective as well. It's looking and saying, okay, how do we how do we improve the business? And you know, one of the really interesting things is seeing how people. Uh, address different business situations, how they, the things they discover, the things that surprise them, the things they're able to, you know, remediate. You know, it's interesting when, you know, you take microservices. I didn't know this late level of latency would cause this problem. Or, you know, we've had customers who have discovered bugs in their software from daylight savings time. Customers have issues all the time with daylight savings time, and they can go and test it and remediate uh, those issues. And that's that's fun when customers are like, oh, wow, I tried this and I was able to identify this issue. I'm not going to have this issue anymore. That's really rewarding because they're actually learning stuff that they didn't expect, things that surprised them. So they can, to your point about kind of the exercising, Tim, and stressing things out, Mm -hmm. can go and see what happens when you know we have those things that affect us versus those things that happen to us, right? Both mm -hmm. can cause outages and problems for us, but we can kind of analyze and look and say, sometimes external events happen. How can we deal with that? How can we make sure that we're more resilient to that? And that's really very enjoyable because you're helping because different customers have different, you know, different issues, right? And want to make sure that their applications Right, like Confluent, you know, which you know had parameters, its settings, you know, work given potential infrastructure outages, and can always make sure that it's working with us for trading application, credit card fraud detection, insurance, etc. Absolutely. So, two more questions. I, I uh, we're talking about concepts, but I'm kind of curious, um, like, what form does the software take? How does how does Gremlin work? And like I said, don't don't be afraid of talking about a thing that. Um, it's, it's awesome that there's a free tier. That's great. But how does it work and tie it into, I think this is somewhat obvious, but, uh, and this is a podcast about, uh, Conf Confluent Kafka and the cloud, as I say. And so t tie it into Kafka. Like what if I'm using Confluent cloud? How does Gremlin impact my life? How do I, how do I use it for my Confluent cloud application that has other services elsewhere on prem and in the cloud? Just talk, how does it work? And then how does it work with Kafka? Yeah. So. You know, dependencies, you know, you could look at dependencies like we touched on earlier, right? What happens if this service can't talk to this service? External service, for example. What does that do to the application? What does that do to the business requirements that they need to meet? 
the SLAs they need to meet, the services that they're obligated to for their customers. So my um, microservices in a managed Kubernetes cluster somewhere, uh, all integrated through Confluent Cloud, expecting right. to uh, produce and consume from from those clusters. Right, because you know I may have increased load. So so how do I make sure that that increased load can be handled properly? Right. How do I increase latency? What if I have packet loss? So when we kind of think about those network attacks, those are things that happen around us. Whether you're talking about, you know, packet loss, latency, you know, or service just vanishing. You know, how do I how do I go and deal with that? How do you know how do I make sure that I can handle you know, those things? Right. You know, you know, um, COVID nineteen kind of identified a spike. You know, in certain services, as Tammy was outlining, right? You know, with you know, food delivery, HEB, and other ones, kind of went through went through the roof. So, you know, while a lot of businesses hurt, we saw customers saying, "My business has gone up three hundred percent month over right. month. I need to go and make sure that I can scale and and work on things so that you know people can get the services they need because they can't go to restaurants, they can't you know go to their bars, etc." But they 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 got deliveries. Yes. Yeah, and there's been a lot of that at my house. <laughs> yeah, and then as, as it relates to you know say just you know Kafka on premise, right? You know there are a whole number of cases there, right? I might you know go and say okay, I have you know a broker that failed. Well, I want to make sure that my settings, my min in sync replicas, are set properly to allow. X number of brokers to fail, but still be able to send the data from my producer to, you know, X number of consumers. Absolutely. Or, you know, what if, you know, I have increased CPU or disk IO on my brokers? How does that affect end to end latency at you know, the 99th or 95th percentile? Because I need to make sure that certain transactions get certain places in a certain amount of time. So, I want to kind of look at that and see what do I need to do in order to maintain that. And in that self-managed uh, case, which still applies to plenty of people, Gremlin uh, Gremlin allows me to simulate or cause those kinds of conditions. There's like, is it an agent? I mean, that's what I'm just kind of wondering, like physically, what is this thing? Yeah. Um, so there is an agent. So on the systems, right? On the systems, there's an agent that gets installed. On Kubernetes clusters, there's a daemon set that gets installed. Ah, nice. Okay. Yep. And then we also have another um, product called Alfie, which is application level failure injection, where you can use our library to inject failure. So yeah, there's a quite a number of different ways to inject failure with Gremlin. I think um, like one of the common use cases that makes me think, um, you know, Pat's story made me think about it. During the pandemic, auto scaling was a really big focus for folks because yeah, they had to scale like they've never scaled before. And it's really, really good to to test that before, you know, you actually have to be in that situation to make sure that you can go up and you can come back down and everything works as expected. So you can do that with Gremlin as well. You can trigger auto scaling to occur by injecting uh, CPU. That's an example of an attack. So you can spike CPU, watch the auto scaling occurs as expected, watch that it then goes back down when you turn CPU back off the attack. And then you'll see lots of issues come up because of that. And not only related to maybe auto scaling configuration, but dependencies, monitoring and observability, backups, like just like all these different types of issues will come up. But like I've never ever seen someone do chaos engineering and not identify issues actually, which is surprising. Yeah, I'm doing it for you, such a long time now, you know, it's like, wow, like just every single time. <laughs> if you haven't tested your auto scaling and, and you, you do this for the first time, it's going to yeah, be, I mean, auto -scaling, be is, auto scaling is a, is a great example. So whether you're doing, you know, system auto scaling, right. So like we look at trading applications, right. You know, during a pandemic, um, you know, we saw 2000 point swings in the market in one day. Mm -hmm. So, really want to go and adjust our auto scaling policy so that, you know, we probably want to scale out faster and scale in slower because of the immense um, program trading that, you know, that was going on that was causing these wild swings. So, you know, that's a really interesting thing. But also when we look at it more from a Kubernetes perspective, right, horizontal pod auto scaling, right, because I might want to do horizontal pod auto scaling within my Kubernetes environment, right? And then I might also want to do that in combination with, with system auto scaling. So it really, you know, our platform can do both 
so that you can look at it from a very holistic perspective. Yes, yes, I see that. And it doesn't matter, like from the standpoint of, of, of Kafka things, whether you're using the, the fully managed cloud, that becomes now a dependency, I think, in your, in your language and availability and latency and, and just, can I talk to the thing? The internals aren't a problem because it's cloud service. You're not supposed to mm-hmm. be a problem. But then if you are managing it yourself, you've got all the dials on all those individual things. Yeah. And that's something really common that we have noticed, you know, over the last few years is folks are um, relying on a lot of really critical services, but sometimes they will have issues on their side that stops them from being able to communicate with these really critical services or have a failover plan in case something goes wrong or even alert that there's an issue communicating. So that's what we do at Gremlin a lot as well is make sure that those critical paths are always clear um, you know, you just want to make sure that you're looking at that. That's my biggest tip as an SRE. It's like always be watching. And also, you know, you don't have to hire SREs to think like this. Like everyone can think like an SRE. It's it's talking about exactly what we talked about today in the podcast. Yeah. Everybody can easily learn how to think like one. Uh, yeah. It's expensive to learn how to do like one because there are <laughs> a lot of specific skills there. But that's yeah. the thing that, that this automates. And yeah, I appreciate you pointing that out. Far be it from any of us to suggest that the availability problem would be in Confluent Cloud. Obviously, it's just going to be on your side getting to it, right? I mean, that's <laughs> crazy to think that that would, that would happen. Or would, yeah, it could be a cloud provider. It could be a cloud provider. I've, I've definitely seen a lot of issues with cloud providers. I would say, yeah. like, um, you know, and that's that's the world that we live in. It's, it's not easy to set up, um, you know, cross-region replication yet. There's just a lot of things that aren't easy. <laughs> no, nope, they're... And the funny thing is they're, they're part of a story we've been telling like for 15 years now. Yes, I know. Right? And yeah. it's still this delicate it's thing that a few experts can engineer if they try real hard. Yep. Um, yep. But it's getting easier. It's, it's getting yeah, to I mean, be more commonplace. Yeah. It really requires looking at the holistic picture and figuring those things out. Um what those external dependencies are. So you take, you know, uh, Confluent Cloud, right? I may want to say I have a producer on prep that does something, right? I want to see what a delay in, of adding latency at the producer end means for the data all the way at the other end, at the consumer end. It has to go to Confluent Cloud, right? Mm-hmm. From the on-prem producer, right? Mm-hmm. So what is the impact of adding latency at the producer level? We see customers wanting to do that, add latency, and then seeing what the effect is on those consum- on those consumers, whether that's one or two, et cetera, yeah. and what that effect is. So there's a number of places that you can interject latency or various other things you know, from point of creation to you know, point of absorption. This all sounds pretty cool. Tammy, you gave a URL that I think was the free tier, but if, if folks want to check it out, what should they do? Yeah, just go along to gremlin.com slash free um, and you can check out Gremlin, give it a go. So you have full access to all of our different attack types. And yeah, let us know how you go. I'm on Twitter, uh, Tammy X um, Bryant. And yeah, you can actually find me there. And then Pat's also on Twitter if you want to reach out to us. And also, actually, if you want to chat to other folks that are doing chaos engineering, SRE work, we have almost 8,000 people in our Slack. So if you go to gremlin.com slash Slack, you can join our community and meet other like-minded folk who are interested in identifying weaknesses by injecting failure um, and improving reliability, which is lots of fun. All those links will be in the show notes. My guests today have been Tammy Buto and Pat Brennan. Uh, Tammy and Pat, thanks for being a part of Streaming Audio. Oh, thank you very much. And there you have it. Hey, you know what you get for listening to the end? Some free Confluent Cloud. Use the promo code 60PDCAST, that's 60PDCAST, to get an additional $60 of free Confluent Cloud usage. Be sure to activate it by December 31st, 2021, and use it within 90 days after activation. Any unused promo value after the expiration date is forfeit. And there are a limited number of codes available, so don't miss out. Anyway, as always, I hope this podcast was useful to you. If you want to discuss it or ask a question, you can always reach out to me on Twitter at TL Berglund. That's T-L-B-E-R-G-L-U-N-D. Or you can leave a comment on a YouTube video or reach out 
on Community Slack or on the Community Forum. There are sign-up links for those things in the show notes if you'd like to sign up. And while you're at it, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and to this podcast wherever fine podcasts are sold. And if you subscribe through Apple Podcasts, be sure to leave us a review there. That helps other people discover it, especially if it's a five-star review. And we think that's a good thing. So thanks for your support, and we'll see you next time.